If God dwells within me, and my book says He does, then that's always been a part of my makeup. I just never could use it before. In my chase for money, power, prestige, sex, and what I thought were the good things of life, those thoughts had to be repressed to let me operate on the level I wanted to operate on. But now that resentments are gone, they automatically come to the surface. I've never seen anything like this before. I don't really understand how this works. I simply know that if I do the simple things the book tells me to do, this happens automatically. And let's go to page 67, and we'll see if we can't find the information to fill out the last two columns. In the second paragraph on page 67, it says, referring to our list again, so you've got to have a written inventory. This is the second time we've had to go back to it now. Referring to our list again, putting out of our minds the wrongs others had done, we resolutely looked for our own mistakes. Uh-oh. <laughs> we've never done this, have we? We've always looked to see what they did. We've never looked to see what we did. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, and frightened? Though a situation had not been entirely our fault, we tried to disregard the other person involved entirely. Where were we to blame? The inventory was ours, not the other man's. When we saw our faults, we listed them. We placed them before us in black and white. We admitted our wrongs honestly and were willing to set these matters straight. So we go to the fourth column. And if you'll notice the heading on the fourth column said, What did I do? Putting out of mind the wrongs others have done, I resolutely look for my own mistakes. What did I do, if anything, to set in motion trains of circumstances which in turn caused people or institutions to hurt me and eventually led to my resentment of them for doing so? So I went to column four. And I looked at this uh, lady named Barbara. And I said, now, Charlie, you forget what she did. You forget her filing for three divorces. What did you do, if anything, to set that in motion? And it took me just about five seconds to realize that if I hadn't been out there screwing around, she probably wouldn't have caught me. And she probably wouldn't have filed for divorce in the first place. Another three or four seconds and I was able to say to myself, well, if I hadn't have been blowing all of her money on booze and what I think was important, she probably wouldn't have filed for divorce in the first place. And I began to realize why I loved that resentment. Because you see, when I could concentrate on her filing for divorce... And play that over and over and over and over in my head. Gradually distorting the picture every time I played it over. Making what she did a little bit worse and what I did a little bit less. And let me play it long enough. I could gradually transfer all blame to her. And make myself as pure as the driven snow. And it was all her damn fault in the first place. I thought, my God, Charlie, have you done that with any other resentments here? I looked at the Internal Revenue Service. I said, now forget what they're doing to you trying to put you in jail. What did you do, if anything, to set in motion the fact they're trying to put you in jail? Why well, it didn't take two seconds to be able to say if I hadn't been cheating on my income tax... They wouldn't have been trying to put me in jail anyhow. Showing this resentment against Rose, what did you do, if anything, to set that in motion? Charlie was out there screwing around, but I was committing adultery. Okay. (laughs) 
sneaking around behind her back and lying to her all the time. And Rose finally got enough of it. She said, I'll show him. And she went out and had her own affair. I went down through my list of resentments. I never found a name on there that I hadn't done something to them to set this thing in motion. And I had resented it and played it over and over and distorted the picture, transferred all blame to them, made myself as pure as the driven snow. If you're a practicing alcoholic, you've got to develop these kind of skills. (laughs) You know, we have a conscience. We're not drunken bums. We know the difference between right and wrong. And I don't think we could live with ourselves if we had to honestly see what was going on whenever we're out there doing our thing. But you see, we never have to see it because we've got this convenient thing called resentments that we play them over and over, distort the picture, and transfer all blame to others until we take an honest look at these resentments and see the part that we played. Now in the fifth column, you see the major character defects talked about in the big book. Where had I been selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, or inconsiderate? All other character defects stem from these. In the fifth column, I asked myself this question. Which of the above character defects caused me to do what I did? Or caused me to want to hold on to the old resentment even though I may have done nothing to cause it? Now going back to Barbara again. If I hadn't have been so selfish, I wouldn't have been out there doing those things that hurt my wife and children. If I hadn't have been so dishonest, I, I wouldn't have been sneaking around behind her back lying to her all the time. If I hadn't have been so self-seeking and frightened, saying to myself, man, you're getting close to 40 years old. If you're ever going to do some of that, you better go do it before it's too late. Fear drives us to do things like that. If I hadn't been so inconsiderate of my wife and children, I wouldn't have been taking the chance of hurting them in the first place. I begin to see in the fifth column the type of character I had become through my years of living a life run on self-will. And when I saw it, I didn't like it. It made me sick. You see, I always fancied myself as a reasonably good person until I saw how I'd become so selfish and so dishonest and so inconsiderate of other people that I was continually doing things that hurt others and they retaliated and I resented for it. I begin to see that if I don't change those things in the fifth column, if I stay selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate that I'm going to keep right on doing the same old things I've always done, drunk or sober. I'm going to keep right on hurting people. And they're going to retaliate. And I'm going to resent. And eventually it's going to block me off from God and I'm going to get drunk over it. But just think, if I could become a little less selfish, oh, I don't have to get perfect, I never will. But if I could become a little less selfish, if I could become a little less dishonest, if I could become less frightened and self-seeking, if I could become a little more considerate of other people and their needs and their wants, maybe I wouldn't have to do some of that kind of stuff. Maybe I wouldn't hurt people. And maybe they wouldn't retaliate and I wouldn't have to resent. And just maybe I wouldn't have to get drunk over it. You see, what we're really doing here is step four. This is the resentment part of it. But out in the fifth column, I now see the exact nature of the wrongs that I'm going to talk to another human being about when I take step five. The resentment is the wrong. That's what blocks me off from God. But what's the exact nature of it? That means what's the truth of it. What's at the core of it? What's the inherent characteristic of it? That's what we'll talk about in step five. 
You know, when a guy comes to me and he's committed adultery 44 times, I don't care about that. All I want to know is what is within him that caused him to do it in the first place. If he's stolen 364 times, I don't care about that. What I want to know is what's within him that caused him to do that. That's what we'll talk about in step five. In that fifth column, I now see the character defects, and I'm going to become willing to turn loose of in step six. Out there in that fifth column, I see the shortcomings now. I'm going to ask God to take away in step seven. And in my case, all the names from column one came off of this sheet to be added to the sheet later to be used for steps eight and nine. Because you see, when I get to step eight, it says I've got the list. I made it when I took step four. In my case, every one of those. In your case, probably some of them. Now, what I've really done, if I have done this the way the big book says, is I have prepared myself with all the information I need for steps four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine, resentment-wise. Now, I hear some of you saying, and, and I hear awful good. I've got good hearing. Charlie hears good. <clears throat> I hear some of you saying, well, well, Charlie, that's probably right on those that we did something to them. But how about those that did it to us? And we didn't have anything to do with that. How about those that hurt us as kids growing up? How about those that hurt us in our marriages that we didn't do anything to cause it? Aren't we justified in having that kind of resentment? Well, I guess we are if we want to get drunk over it. But you see, a justified resentment blocks you off from God just like an unjustified resentment does. When you've got a justified resentment churning around in your head, then whoever or whatever you're resenting is controlling your thinking. If they're controlling your thinking, they're controlling your decisions. They're controlling your life for you. And you have given them power to actually kill you. Because you've given them power to cause you to get drunk again. Now, if you've got one of those resentments, and I don't care what it is. I don't care whether it's physical abuse, mental abuse, sexual abuse, or whatever. And I keep hearing in AA all the time this sexual abuse thing. And it usually centers on young women. But let me tell you something. Men know about that too. I don't know how many fifth steps I've taken with men. And nearly every one of us, somewhere in the background, we've had that kind of stuff too. It's not just women, it's men. If you've got one of those kind of resentments and you don't want to get rid of it, knowing full well it might get you drunk, then we better get it on this sheet of paper and take a look at it and see what we're doing with it. We're probably using it for rationalization and justification. To rationalize not doing things we ought to go do. Or just as importantly, to rationalize and justify doing things that we shouldn't be doing in the first place. Oh, the greatest excuse in the world is, if they hadn't have done that to me, then I wouldn't have to be the way I am today. They call that victimization. Now, I don't really think we've got any place for that in AA. We're all adults. It's time for us to realize that whatever's happened to in, us in the past does not have to control what we do today. And it really doesn't make any sense to let somebody hurt me 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago and then let them hurt me every day for the rest of my life. If I'm resenting them, they've got me and they're going to kill me. I need to put them on this sheet. Put down their name. What did they do to me? What part of self is affected? What did I do, if anything, to set it in motion? In this case, nothing. But then let's look in the fourth column. Are we so dishonest with ourselves we refuse to see the truth? 
Let's look in the fifth column and see if maybe we are so frightened of facing life without it. We refuse to turn it loose. Because, you know, after all, if we turn it loose, then we've got to take responsibility for our own behavior. It's a hell of a lot easier to blame it on others. Are we so afraid of facing life without it? We won't turn it loose. Are we so inconsiderate of another human being that we fail to recognize that people that do those things to us, they're not necessarily bad people. They're sick people. They didn't necessarily do it to us. They would have done it to anybody in that position. If we could even begin to consider that, maybe we can start a forgiving process. Maybe we could straighten up a relationship with another human being before it's too late. After they're dead, it's too late. I'll guarantee you it is. Maybe we can do it while we're all still alive. If we will do those things, I think we can get rid of that resentment too when we really see the truth behind it and what we're doing with it. If we can't get rid of it that way, then we can use the ultimate tool. By golly, we can pray for them. And if we pray for one of those people who resent, that doesn't mean that we approve of what they did. That doesn't mean we're going to take them by the hand and walk hand in hand with them for the rest of our life. What it means is we're tired of letting them control us, dominate us, and rule us every day for the rest of our life. We can get rid of those kind of resentments too. And if we don't want to do that, then chances are we're using it for some reason. And we need to look at it very, very carefully, Joe. It takes two people to make a prison, the prisoner and the jailer. have to turn them loose and let them out and turn them loose. All those people that I hated had to turn them loose. Charlie said, I don't want to be a victim in, anymore. And I don't think Alcoholics Anonymous may be the only association left on the face of the earth that won't allow us to be victims. There's victims going on all out there. Everybody wants to be a victim of something, you know. But we in AA won't let each other do that because we have a way out. When everything else fails, we can pray for them. They need the prayers and we need to practice. <laughs> You know, I see in many AA meetings where we've gone into this group therapy stuff and we sit around the table and we discuss what those people did to us and we try to figure out why they did it. We'll never understand why they did it. The thing is, they did it. Then we start trying to discuss and figure out why it made us the way we are. We'll never understand that. The fact is, that's the way we are. The real question is, what are we going to do about it? Are we going to continue to let them kill us? Or are we going to get rid of that jazz? That's what AA is about. It's not to sit around and talk about problems. It's to sit around and talk about how do you solve the problems. And resentment is the number one problem for every alcoholic. And if we can get rid of them, then we're peaceful, happy, and free. Until we do, we'll never be free of it. We went through a process yesterday afternoon, the first part of the inventory process. There we learn how to look at our resentments, to take an honest, truthful, moral inventory. And as we listed those resentments, we begin to see the truth about them, really. Now, the first thing we saw in column one is how many resentments we really did have, how much that blocked us off from the sunlight of the Spirit. The second thing we saw in column two, it's not those people or institutions we resent. It's what they've done to us that we actually resent. The third thing we found out in column three, it's really not even what they've done to us. It's how we choose to react to a threat to one of our basic instincts of life, which is going to determine whether we're resentful or not. So just in filling out those three columns, we learned some very valuable information. We also were able to see in the big book that resentments was an absolute waste of time. That whenever they're churning around in our heads, we're pretty well paralyzed from doing anything worthwhile. And we find that if we honestly look at them, most of us have spent literally thousands and thousands of hours in resentments. And as we look back at that time in our lives, we can see where they really never did do us any good. They never really straightened up a relationship with another human being never made us feel better, only made us feel worse, 
never made us any money for sure. And as far as we can tell, it's absolute wasted time. But we also said that's not the worst thing about our resentment. The worst thing is it very effectively blocks us off from God. Blocked off from God, we don't feel good. We begin to become insane. We begin to think about taking a drink. Next thing you know, we end up drunk all over again. And when we truthfully and honestly looked at those resentments, we could really begin to see how other people have controlled and dominated us throughout our entire lifetime through those resentments. Now, we always thought that we had it under control, that we determined what we said and what we did, but we suddenly realized that we really have done nothing but react to others through our resentment toward them. That looks so stupid to us that about 95% of those resentments automatically disappeared. The other 5% that was so deeply embedded, we found through prayer that we could remove them also so we could be resentment-free if we follow the, the uh, procedures outlined in the big book. The real revealing thing is, though, the amazing thing is that after we became resentment-free, God wouldn't allow another hole in our head. It had to be replaced with something else. The only thing that could replace it was the opposite of the resentment. And where we used to feel resentment, we now feel serenity, a little peace of mind, a little happiness, compassion, goodwill, love. Those are all God's thinking rather than our individual thinking. And we found that that came to us automatically. Those things had always been a part of us. We just never could use them before. Now that resentments are gone, then God's thinking automatically begins to replace the resentment and we're much less chance of getting drunk now than we were when we started the process. We went back to the resentment sheet, and we looked at it from an entirely different angle now. We began to look at it to see what had we done to set that thing in motion, or what did we do? We had never looked at before. And in our fourth column, we found that in almost all cases, whatever the resentment was, we ourselves did something to set it in motion. And we hurt other people, they retaliated, we resented, we played the resentment over and over and over, distorted the picture, finally transferred all blame to other people. A good practicing alcoholic has to be able to do that. We just couldn't live if we didn't have that ability. So we really, in the fourth column, really did begin to look at the truth of the resentment to see the part that we had played. And in most cases, we ourselves set the ball rolling. We looked in the fifth column to see the exact nature of that resentment. The resentment was the wrong, but what was at the actual core of it or at the center of it? And in the fifth column, we found the type personality that we had developed through our years of living on self-will and living as a practicing alcoholic. And we found just about every time we had hurt anybody in the past, it was either through selfishness or through dishonesty, or because we were self-seeking frightened, or through inconsideration of other people. And we begin to see in the fifth column that if we don't change those things, we're going to keep right on doing the same things in sobriety that we used to do when drinking. We're going to continue to hurt people. They're going to retaliate, we'll resent, and eventually get drunk over it. And we begin to see in the fifth column the things that we will need to change in our personality if we want to live with peace of mind, serenity, and happiness in the future. We summed it up by saying we were in the process of doing the resentment part of step four. In the fifth column, we now had all the information we needed for steps five, six, and seven. And in the names in the first column, those that we had harmed, they come off of there to be added to the list to be used for eight and nine at a later date. So we really ended up in this simple little inventory with all the information we needed for four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine resentment wise. Very positive thing took place. Resentments disappeared, and they were replaced with love, patience, tolerance, compassion, and goodwill. So there was nothing to be afraid of. There was nothing too complicated. There was not a list of dirty, filthy, nasty items, just a simple inventory. Now, we don't want to give you the impression <clears throat> that you can always be 100% free of resentments. You know, God never gave us anything bad. It depends on what we do with things as to whether they become bad or not. 
A resentment used right can be used for a worthwhile purpose. If somebody does something to me that threatens my self-esteem, if it would cause me to look at me and see some things that I need to change, and I go ahead and make those changes, then that resentment can be used for a worthwhile purpose. For instance, if we're living in the neighborhood, all the old houses are run down. Mine's no worse than anybody else's. They all need painting. They've got broken window screens and panes. And I sit on my front porch each evening after work, and I rock and I rock, and I'm very complacent about that situation. One day I look up, though, and some idiot has moved in across the street. He's out there painting his house, fixing his window screens and window panes, makes my house look bad. I resent the hell out of him for doing that. I say, who in the hell is he moving here and in here and screwing up this whole neighborhood? Now, if I use that resentment right, it'll cause me to look at my house and become a little bit ashamed of it. Next thing you know, I paint my house, fix my window screens and window panes. My next-door neighbor resents me for doing so. <laughs> next thing you know, he fixes his house up, and his neighbor resents him. And after a while, God's got the whole neighborhood cleaned up like it should have been in the first place. That's the proper use of a resentment. But we alcoholics won't use it that way. We'll sit on the front porch, and we'll rock, and we'll rock, and we'll resent, and we'll resent. Thirty days later, we'll go over at midnight and burn his damn house down. We'll show him. <laughs> <clears throat> So it really depends on what we do with resentments that determines whether they're going to be for bad or good. And if we use one rightly, it's going to disappear anyhow. The ones that kill us are those that we just leave in our head, and it is fester and fester and fester, and we get sicker and sicker until eventually it creates a real problem for us. Joe? This morning we're going to talk about fears a bit, and uh, we're, going to, no, we're not going to psychoanalyze ourselves in any manner. We're simply going to do like the book suggested yesterday. We're going to find the facts, and we're going to face the facts, and eventually through this process we're going to accept the facts as they really are, truthfully. And it says also that when the spiritual malady is overcome, we straighten out mentally and physically. The spiritual malady not only is my relationship with God, but my relationship with me, my mental attitudes, and my relationship with other people. <clears throat> so that's just another form of spiritual malady that I had. And Dr. Jung said we're going, to, that we're going to have a look at our ideas, emotions, and attitudes. And that's what we're doing through this inventory process. We're looking at ideas, emotions, and attitudes and see where they came from. And if we will, we'll go back now to page 18. And I'm going to read this little paragraph and tells my whole story in one little paragraph. It says, an illness of this sort, and we've come to believe it an illness, involves those about us in a way no other human sickness can. If a person has cancer, all are sorry for him, and no one is angry or hurt. But not so with the alcoholic illness. For with it goes annihilation of all things worthwhile in life, and engulfs all whose lives touch the sufferers. It brings misunderstanding, fierce resentment, financial insecurity, disgusted friends and employers, warped lives of blameless children, sad wives and parents, and anyone can increase the list. In other words, it's a family illness. It affects everybody in the family to some extent. And if you live with one of us very long, you'll be affected by it in some manner, for sure. And as I look back in my life to see where these ideas, emotions, and attitudes that were, the, that were to become the guiding force of my life started way, way back. So now let's go back to page 67. And again, we're not trying to psychoanalyze ourselves. I just found the facts. I accepted the facts as I looked at the facts, and I could see where I'd come from. It said, notice that the word fear is bracketed alongside the difficulties with Mr. Brown, Miss Jones, the employer, and the wife. Six times along that column. This short word somehow touches about every, every aspect of our lives. It was an evil and corroding thread. The fabric of our existence was shot through with it. It set in motion trains of circumstances which brought us misfortune we felt we didn't deserve. You know, you do the crime, you do the time. That's the way that is. But we did not we ourselves set the ball rolling. See, I did that myself to me because I didn't know any better sometimes we think that fear ought to be classed with stealing it seems to cause more trouble now we reviewed our fears thoroughly we put them on paper even though we had no resentment in connection with them we asked ourselves why we had them here it is for me wasn't it because that self-reliance failed self-reliance was good as far as it went but didn't go far enough 
Some of us once had great self-confidence, but it didn't fully solve the fear problem or any other. When it made us cocky, it was worse. So what we're going to do here this morning is basically, it's about the same thing that we did with resentments. We have a little list here, and it's a review of our fears. <clears throat> and we're simply going to look at our fears, where they come from, the ideas, emotions, and attitudes behind them, and what we're fearful of, and we're going to write them down in these columns, just like we did with resentments. And it won't take very long to do this. In the first column, it says, who or what did I fear? I list people, institutional principles with whom I fear. And again, in column one, I simply write down the, the people, the institutions, and, pe and the principles that I feared, leaving a little space from top to bottom, one column at a time. And we list those. Now, we men tend to say, well, we don't have much fear. We're tough. We're macho. But we're not talking about physical fear anyhow. We're talking about all these fears that run through the mind from time to time. And I think if we carefully look at them, we'll find that we all have fears connected certainly with our marriages. We have fears connected with our children. We have fears connected with our jobs. We have fears connected with the Internal Revenue Service. We have fears connected with the police department. We have fears connected with the federal government. We have fears connected with the church. We could just go on and on and on and name literally thousands of fears that people have. Now, I'm not going to attempt to psychoanalyze myself. I'm not going to say, you know, that, that, that these fears are, are things that come from things way back in my early childhood, like Mother uh, setting me sideways on the potty when I'm two years old or something. What I, some fear we're supposed to have anyhow. It's just like resentments. Fear can be used for a worthwhile purpose if they're used right. Mainly what we're looking at are these fears in our head that just continually kind of control us and rule us and dominate us. We've made a decision to let God direct our thinking. And if we have that many fears, then God can't, the fears do. And I found out the same thing here with these fears that I did with resentments. I didn't think I had very many fears. Instead, I started putting them on a piece of paper. You can only see one at a time in your head. But as I began to fill out sheet after sheet after sheet, I began to realize how much fear really does control me, rule me, and dominate me. So I did the same thing that I did with resentments, started top to bottom, listed each fear, leaving a little space between each one of them. And it's amazing when we see how much fear we really do have. We'll never see it till we put it on a sheet of paper. Joe? See, for many years, I didn't think I had any fears at all. I thought that was a very, very brave attitude that I had. And after I filled out this first column, I could see that the fears was throughout my whole attitude and outlook on life. It permeated every part of my life. I was fearful of everything and everyone, and I did not know that. I didn't know that. So I go to the sex, co sex column, second column. <laughs> No, he got it on his mind got this morning, mind. Happy, huh? Yeah. I can hardly wait. I believe he must have got over his headache. Yeah. That brain damage this morning, <laughs> thinking about it. So I say, simply go to the second column, and I write down beside each of these people or principles or institutions whom I'm fearful. What am I, what am I afraid of in, in conjunction with those people? Am I afraid that, what are them, am I afraid they're going to do something to me? Am I perhaps going to go to jail for some of the things that I did? Am I going to lose something of value? Am I going to lose face? Will it result in divorce? Will it destroy a personal relationship? Am I li might lose my job? Those kind of questions I ask myself beside each of those people and institutions and principles as I listed in step one. And once one. again, as we fill out that second column and we begin to look at these fears, we're going to find that nearly all of them are going to revolve around about one of two or three things anyhow. Nearly every fear I've ever had revolves around the fact that I'm either not going to get something that I really want, or I'm going to lose something I've already got, or I've done something to another human being I shouldn't have done, and I'm worried to death about what they're going to do whenever they catch me. Nearly all of them will, will center somewhere around those things. So we simply just put down the cause of the fear. You know, and again, I'm not going to say, well, I'm afraid of the dark because Mother set me on the potty sideways some fear I'm supposed to have. You bet you I'm a little bit afraid of the dark. Why? Well, I don't have headlights and I can't see at night, and that keeps me from getting hurt. It brings caution. I'm a little bit afraid of the heights. Why? Well, I don't have wings and I can't fly. 
keeps me from getting hurt. But if those kind of fears should keep me from going outside after dark, if they should keep me from riding in an elevator or an airplane, then I better look at them very closely. They're beginning to really, really rule me and dominate me. Most of my fears, though, center around just basically two or three things. I'm afraid I'm going to lose what I got, not going to get what I want, or I've done something I shouldn't have, and I'm afraid what they're going to do when they catch me. Very simple process. Column three. I go to column three, and what part of self was affected? And again, that's why I need that information on the basic instincts of life and the working knowledge of some of those words and ideas to enable to, enable to do the third column. <clears throat> You know, if you don't have a God in your life and you're living without God and, you're, and, and you don't need other people and you're living on your own uh, will, then you're the only one thing you can do, and that's to try to satisfy your basic instincts of life. And that's what I was doing. I was operating on my own. So what part of myself was affected? Was it my self-esteem? Was it my security and my ambitions, personal or sex relations, which been interfered with? Is those the things that happened, and I look down at the, the third column, and beside each name, again, in each uh, instance, I write down one of those basic instincts of life, the part of me that was affected by these things. You know, I can't experience fear unless there's a threat to one of the basic instincts of life. And I found out as I filled out the third column, just like I did with resentments, I found out where fear comes from. You know, I didn't know where resentments came from. I didn't know where anger came from. I didn't know where fear comes from. Today I realize it comes from a threat to one of these basic instincts of life. And just like with a resentment, if my basic instincts are at the level that God intends for them to be, if my relationship with God is right, then you can do about anything you want to to me, and I'm not going to experience fear because of it. But I'll guarantee you if my instincts are not under control, my relationship with God is not right, then about anything you do or say to me is going to create fear. Absolutely amazing what we learn by, about ourselves just by filling out these simple little columns. Now let's go to the fourth column. Go to the fourth column, and we try to put out of our minds all these things that happened so far, and we write down, what did I do? What did I do to set the ball rolling? Did I do the crime to do the time? Yes, I did that. Was it when my wife was going to divorce me and I was fearful of it? What did I do? What were some of the things that I did? Well, I was uncaring for her. I didn't care about her. Didn't consider her in any manner, in any way. And therefore, I was afraid, and I didn't know that. See, I really didn't know that I was afraid of those things. It told us way back in step three that we invariably find that we've made decisions based on self, which later placed us in a position to be hurt. And we've made decisions trying to satisfy our basic instincts of life. And running on self-will, those basic instincts become insatiable things. We never get enough to satisfy them. And we're continually doing things that end up hurting and harming and creating other people. And then we've got to be scared to death what they're going to do whenever they catch us. And even if they don't catch us, the guilt and the remorse eats us up here, just like with resentments. So we begin to look at the part we played, and we find that we did the same thing with fears that we did with resentments. As we played them over and over and over in our head, we actually distorted the picture. And the fears that we have in our head today are not true. Oh, they started on truth, but they are no longer true. You see, well, that's one of the definitions of one of those wrongs. Fear is incorrect believing. And if we carefully look at each one of these fears... We're going to find that they're absolutely wrong. They started with truth. We've distorted the picture. And once again, we've used them to transfer blame to others so we don't ever have to look at ourselves. Same identical thing as with resentments. Now let's look into the fifth column. In the fifth column, I simply look down in, the, in these instances. Was I selfish in those interests? In those particular items, yes, I was very selfish because I was so fearful I was selfish. I was afraid I was going to lose things that I already had or I was afraid I wasn't going to get some things that I wanted. Was I dishonest? Yes, I was dishonest. I took things from other people that didn't belong to me, and I was very dishonest. It seemed to me like to be successful in any manner was okay with me. So I was extremely a dishonest person, and I, certainly I didn't know that particularly. And then I was self-seeking and frightened and inconsiderate of other people for sure. Because I wanted what I wanted when I wanted it, and I didn't make a damn how I got it was the way I looked at my life. And if you got in my way, you just shouldn't have. So I was a very selfish, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate individual. 
and I did not know that. You know, it's absolutely a life living on hell. Whenever you're scared to death, you're not going to get something. You really do want it. And then through dishonesty, you go ahead and get it. And then you've got to be scared to death what they're going to do whenever they catch you. And even if they don't catch you, the guilt and the remorse eat you up. And our lives really do become an absolute living hell in trying to satisfy these basic instincts of life. And we just really drive ourselves absolutely dingy until we get an opportunity to truthfully look at these things. Now, out there in that fifth column, once again, we see the exact nature of the wrong. The fears are what's wrong. The wrong, because we find out most of them are incorrect. They're what block us off from God. But what's the actual truth behind them? Well, if we wasn't so selfish, if we wasn't so dishonest, if we were not so self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate, we wouldn't have to experience near as much fear as we do. But I'll guarantee you, if I stay selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate, the same old things are going to drive me. I'm going to do the same old things I've always done. Fear, guilt, remorse is going to absolutely eat me up. Sooner or later, it blocks me off from God. It causes me to get drunk. So once again, what we're doing here in this little inventory sheet, we are doing step four. This is the fear part of it. Out in this fifth column, we see the exact nature of the wrong for step five, the defects for step six, the shortcomings we're going to ask God to take away in step seven. And then once again, many of the names over here in column one will be people and institutions we've harmed, and we're scared to death what they're going to do whenever they catch us. So those names will come off of column one. They'll be added to the sheet to be used later on for steps eight and nine. We got some off the resentment sheet. We got some off of the fear sheet also. And one thing that absolutely amazed me is when I really looked at this truthfully is I began to see a lot of the names, same names appearing on the fear sheet that I had on the resentment sheet. I had never tied that together in my head before. Barbara was on both sheets. I resented her, and I certainly feared her. And I'm still a little bit afraid of that lady today. If she ever finds out everything that I was doing about 30 years ago, she's probably going to file for divorce again. I don't know. <laughs> I resented the Internal Revenue Service, and I feared the Internal Revenue Service. They were also on both sheets. I never really had tied that together in my head. Now, if you think resentments look stupid in your head, wait till you get these things down on paper about fears. Now, fears look awful good in your head. But when you get them down on a sheet of paper, they really do look double dumb when you see the truth about them. Resentments look stupid. Hell, fears look even worse than that. And they look so dumb, about 95% of them are going to disappear anyhow when you see the truth about them. <coughs> Once again, there's going to be one, two, three, four, or five. It's been embedded in our minds so deeply. We're probably going to have to have a little help in order to get rid of some of those. We now come to the second prayer in the big book on step four regarding fears. You know, when I prayed for those people that I resented, my, my ideas, emotions, and attitude toward them changed. They didn't change, but I did. Now, prior to this idea about these fears, my whole attitude and outlook upon life was involved in these fears. I had fears in every area of my life and didn't know it. Of course, I hadn't had a God in my life either, but I've took step three and I've got God in my life. And now I'm on a different basis. And the book says perhaps there is a better way. We think so, for we're now on a different basis, the basis of trusting and relying upon God. We trust our infinite God rather than our finite selves. We're in the world to play the role He assigns. Just to the extent that we do as we think He would have us and humbly rely on Him, does He enable us to match calamity with serenity. Now, we never apologize to anyone for depending upon our Creator. We can laugh at those who think that spirituality is the way of weakness. Paradoxically, it's the way of strength. The verdict of the ages is that faith means courage. All men of faith have courage. They trust their God. Now, we never apologize for God. Instead, we let him demonstrate through us what he can do. 
is more prayer. We ask him to, him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. And at once, we commence to outgrow fear. And, you know, as I look back at that, my sponsor told me in those early days, he said the most important thing about prayer, two the, mo- the two most important things about prayer, one of them is to start and the other one is to continue. And as I look back over my life, I can see that every time I prayed, I changed just a minute amount, just hardly noticeable. The next time I prayed, it was just a little bit more. And the next time I prayed was a little bit more. And as time goes by, I can see a real reliance upon God today in my life. It wasn't that way in the beginning. But when I started trusting and relying upon God rather than myself, then those fears began to come away from me. They weren't as, as intense as they had been. And they began to get in the area where God intended for them to be. And at once, I commenced to outgrow these fears. You know, we hear always about the promises on page 83 and 84. We never hear about the promises that are spread throughout the entire book. And I think one of the greatest promises to be found anywhere in the book is what Joe just read. We ask him to remove our fear and direct our attention to what he would have us be. At once, we commence to outgrow that fear. Now, we can take these deep-seated fears, just like deep-seated resentments, through prayer on a daily basis, asking God to take this particular fear away from me, direct my attention to what He would have me be instead of that, and at once I commence to outgrow that fear. And over a period of days, as He directs my attention to what He would have me be, and I try to be that, as I ask Him to take that fear away, some morning I wake up and that fear is gone. It really, really does work. And I think the reason that it really works is when we're asking God to take it away and direct our attention to what He would have us be, then that's one of the great expressions of courage and faith that we human beings can have. Courage, faith, and fear will not exist on the same plane. The fear will be replaced by the courage to do the opposite of that fear. And as we begin to change, it will be replaced by faith that God really can do these things. And slowly we can remove those fears too. Now just think, this file cabinet up here in my head that was filled with fears has now been emptied out. That damaged and unsaleable goods caused fear is gone at least to the level that God intends for it to be. Once again, God's not going to allow another hole in my head. The fears, if they disappear, they've got to be replaced with the opposite. And the opposite will be faith and courage the opposite of the fear itself. If God dwells within me, that's always been a part of my makeup. I just never could use it before. In my chase for money, power, prestige, and sex, in my desire to fulfill the basic instincts of life, in my worries about I wouldn't get what I want and and I'd lose what I got or they're going to catch me at it, faith and courage had to be repressed and I had to operate on that fear level. But now that the fear is gone, faith and courage automatically comes to the surface. Another positive happening. Two-thirds of my store now have some peace of mind, serenity, and happiness in them, and I'm in much less chance of drinking now than I was before I started the inventory process. You see, we don't have to wait till step 12 to get something good out of this. Every step brings a positive result. There's nothing negative about any of our program, period. Now, also, just like with the resentment, knowing that fears block you off from God and that they might get you drunk, if you've got a fear that you don't want to turn loose of, you better look at it very, very closely. Because we can also use fear to rationalize and justify not doing something we really would like to do Or just as importantly, we can use it to justify continuing to do things that we know we shouldn't be doing. And if we've got one of those and we don't want to get rid of it, we better look at it very, very closely. Let me give you an example of how you can use fear to rationalize and justify. How many of you in here this morning, and please be truthful with me, how many of you would really like to go back to school and finish your education? Could I see your hand? Oh, my God, about half of you at least. Now I'm going to ask you another question. 
How many of you really do intend to do that? Oh, about a half of those hands went up this time. I wonder why. Nothing in the world but fear. Fear that we won't measure up. Fear of failure. Fear of hard work actually keeps us from doing things that we really would like to do. Now, if we can ask God to take that away and direct our attention to what He have us be instead, then every one of you that wants to go back to school will end up doing it. But until that fear is gone, it's going to drive most of us away and keep us away. We use it to rationalize, justify, just like we did with resentments. So if we got one of those, let's look at that closely too. All my life, I love to work in my hands. All my life, I wanted to build a set of kitchen cabinets. Never would do it because I knew there'd be a lot of mistakes. People would laugh and I would be embarrassed. Now, after I worked the program for quite some time, one time I got the courage to build a set of kitchen cabinets. Now, they don't look very good. and There's a lot of mistakes and people laugh at it, but I really don't give a damn. It don't bother me anymore, see? So we can overcome these things with God's help. It's amazing what we can do with these things. Bottom of page 68. Now about sex. We're getting ready now to to look at the uh, storeroom back here that's filled with guilt and remorse. And it seems as though uh, we human beings hurt each other in the sexual area probably faster and easier than we do in any other way. And I think there's a reason for that. Uh, you know, the other animals here on earth, earth, they have a sexual urge just like we do so that they can and will reproduce themselves. But the difference between their sex life and ours is simply that they don't have this thing called self-will. Most of the other animals here on earth, they don't really have any choice in their sex life. When it comes time for them to reproduce themselves, God usually signifies that by some physical change in the female of the species. The male senses that change, prepares himself. The two join together, and it's kind of like bang, bang, thank you, ma'am. And when it's over with, they normally go their separate ways. Not always, but usually they do. Now, they didn't think about having sex before they had it. And they didn't think about having sex while they were having it. They couldn't decide when they were going to do it. God made that decision for them. They usually can't decide who they're going to do it with. They can't decide whether they're going to do it with one or more partners. They can't decide how many times they're going to do it. And they can't even decide what position they're going to do it in. <laughs> so therefore, you see very few sexual problems amongst the other animals here on earth. I've never seen a cow on a psychiatrist's couch yet <laughs> talking about sexual dysfunction. They just don't have those kind of problems. We human beings are a little bit different. You see, God gives us this thing called self-will. And we can make choices about our sex lives. We can have sex any day of the year that we wish to. We can decide who we're going to have sex with. We can decide whether we're going to have it with one or more partners. We can decide how many times we're going to do it, providing we're physically capable of doing so. We can even decide what position we're going to do it in. They tell me there's something like 64 different positions a human being can have sex in. I have no idea what they are. <laughs> I only found three in my lifetime. And two of those damn near kill me. I'm not sure I'm going back to them. So what we're going to look at here for just a few minutes this morning is not so much as to how we do sex but as to how we think about sex. Because how we think about it determines how we're going to do it. And that determines whether we're going to hurt other people or not. And that determines whether we're going to have to eat and eaten up with fear, guilt, and remorse associated with our sex lives. So we're going to look just a few minutes at how we think about sex. He said many of us needed an overhauling there. Now, you older fellows don't get your hopes up. We're talking about mental, not physical. 
<laughs> but above all, we tried to be sensible on this question. It's so easy to get way off the track. Here we find human opinions running to extremes, absurd extremes perhaps. One set of voices cry that sex is a lust of our lower nature, a base necessity of procreation. I've heard them all my life. They're the ones that say sex is a dirty thing. You ought to do it at one time, in one position, with one person only. The only reason to do it is to reproduce yourself. And if you enjoy it, it's a sinful thing. I've heard them as far back as I can remember. They are to the extremes on one side. Then we have the voices who cry for sex and more sex, who bewail the institution of marriage, who think that most of the troubles of the race are traceable to sex causes. They think we do not have enough of it or that it isn't the right kind. They see its significance everywhere. Then you hear them today. They're the ones that say you ought to be able to have sex anytime you want to, anywhere you want to, with anybody you want to, as many times as you want to. You ought to be able to enjoy it every time, and if you don't, there must be something wrong with you. <laughs> now, maybe they call that the sexual revolution. Main thing I see wrong with it, it happened 25 years too late for me to participate in it. I know that. <laughs> One school would allow a man no flavor for his fare, and the other would have us all on a straight pepper diet. Well, we want to stay out of this controversy. We do not want to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. We all have sex problems. We'd hardly be human if we didn't. What can we do about them? And I read that last statement with great relief, because I knew this book was getting ready to condemn me for what I had been in the past, I knew it was getting ready to tell me what I was going to have to do in the future, and I'd already made up my mind that I wasn't going to pay any attention to it at all. And I was relieved to find out that we're not going to be the arbiter of anyone's sex conduct. We simply are not going to get into that question. And we start trying to tell people how they're going to have to conduct their sex lives. We start condemning them for what they've done in the past, and surely, surely, we're going to alienate people. Besides that, what's sexually acceptable in one part of the world may not be acceptable at all in another part of the world. So we simply are not going to get into that question. What we are going to see is a simple little way to review our own past sex conduct, see what we've been doing with it, see if perhaps we've been using it for the wrong purposes in some cases, look at those people we've hurt by it, then try to shape a sex life of the future where we can still engage in it and enjoy it, yet at the same time not hurt other people. And if we don't do something about it and we continue to hurt other people and feel the fear, guilt, and remorse, sooner or later it will block us off from God and we end up getting drunk over it. We're going to see here the same set of instructions that we use to, for, to look at sex that we had for resentments. Only difference is they're worded a little differently, which is Bill's way of doing things. We reviewed our own conduct over the years past. Where had we been selfish, dishonest, or inconsiderate? Whom had we hurt? Did we unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? Where were we at fault? What should we have done instead? We got this all down on paper and looked at it. So once again, we made up a little sheet to avoid any confusion, and it looks just about exactly like the resentment sheet, except we call it a review of our own sex conduct. And in this little sheet, a review of our own sex conduct, we have the same five columns. Column one, who did I hurt? <clears throat> now, I doubt if there's anybody in this room this morning that ever hurt anybody in the sexual area that we don't remember just exactly who that is. That seems to be a form of knowledge that we all have. There might be some question as to what do we do to hurt people in the sexual area. Well, certainly we hurt them in many different ways. Uh, for instance, if I'm in a married relationship and I go outside of that relationship and I have sex out there, and my wife finds out about it, then surely I've created a problem from her, if not physically, at least emotionally. If that sexual escapade creates a trouble between my wife and I, there's children in my home, then I've hurt my children also by the same sexual escapade. 
If the lady I had sex with out there, if it becomes common knowledge, I've hurt her too. If she has a husband and children, I've hurt them also. You know, one sex act could hurt many, many different people. I think sometimes we hurt people in a sexual area by demanding more than our fair share. Maybe our partner isn't too keen about having sex every time we want to. Rather than consider their needs, wants, and desires, we selfishly demand that they have sex with us when they really don't want to. Surely that creates a problem for them, if not physically, at least emotionally. I think sometimes we hurt people in a sexual area by demanding that they do things with us physically, sexually, that they really don't want to do. And once again, rather than consider their needs and wants, we selfishly demand those things. Surely we create a problem for them, if not physically, at least emotionally. I think sometimes we hurt people in a sexual area just by withholding sex. Maybe we're not too keen to have sex every time our partner wants to. And rather than consider their needs and wants, we selfishly withhold when perhaps we should give in a little more often. I think we hurt many people in many different ways, and we pretty well know what they are. Column one, we list their names. Column two, what did I do to hurt them? Column three, what part of self is affected? Now, you would think if I hurt anybody in a sexual area that it would be caused by the sex instinct. And probably part of the time that's true. Sometimes, in order to get the physical, the emotional gratification that comes at the moment of successful completion of the sex act, maybe I'm doing the wrong thing at the wrong time with the wrong person because of the sex instinct. But I think if we will carefully review each situation, we're going to find that usually the other two instincts are involved just as much as sex, and in many cases even more so, and sometimes sex really doesn't have a hell of a lot to do with it. Now, I'm going to express an opinion, and I want to make sure that everybody understands this is my opinion. It's not AA's opinion, not Joe's, not anybody else's, just mine. Today, I am convinced that God gave us the sex urge so that we could reproduce ourselves. I'm also convinced he made it a very enjoyable thing, so we would do so. I don't think you and I would do the kind of work involved in sex <laughs> if we didn't get something out of it. Now, if we're doing sex for purposes other than reproduction or enjoyment, then we might be doing sex for purposes other than what God intended. For instance... We boys found at a very early age that you can use sex to build your self-esteem. After all, the more members of the opposite sex you can attract to yourself, the greater man you really are, we thought. Now, we boys, I don't know what you girls called it, but we boys called it John Wayneism. Jane Wayne. Joe said Jane Wayne. Some of you girls tell me you, you use sex for the same purposes. Now, if that's what we're using sex for, that has nothing to do with reproduction, really has nothing to do with enjoyment. That's to fulfill a part of the social instinct, and sex really doesn't have a hell of a lot to do with it. Sometimes we use sex to buy a personal relationship. Maybe we're just lonesome. Maybe we just want somebody to pay attention to us. And we found out a long time ago we can give sex and buy back a personal relationship. Now, that's not to reproduce. That's not to enjoy. That's also to fulfill a part of the social instinct. Sometimes we use sex to buy material security. Maybe we're in a sexual situation we really would rather not even be in. But we've become, become so overly dependent upon another human being for our material well-being that we give sex to buy back material well-being has nothing to do with reproduction or enjoyment. That's to fulfill the security instinct. Sometimes we use sex to get even with another human being. Maybe we're in a relationship and our partner's gone out and done something they shouldn't have done and it infuriates the hell out of us, and we say we'll show them and we'll go out and we'll do exactly the same thing. The fallacy in it is, is after we've done it, we can't afford to tell them we did it. 
But certainly we didn't use sex there to reproduce or to enjoy. We used it to get even with another human being. Sex really doesn't have a hell of a lot to do with that. You know, sometimes we use sex to force our will on another human being. Maybe our partner isn't doing what we think they ought to do. We say, we'll show them. We'll just cut them off at the pass. We won't let them have any sex till they come around our way of thinking. Now, we boys aren't too good at that. We only last two days at the most. <laughs> you girls have honed it to perfection. You know exactly how to do that. Now, I don't blame you. I would use it too for that. That has nothing to do with reproduction or enjoyment. That's to force our will on another human being. I, I was absolutely amazed as I filled out that third column to see what I had actually been using sex for. Two things happened to me almost automatically. As I filled out the third column, a lot of my guilt began to disappear. I thought I was just a dirty, rotten, no-good SOB. But I found out that I used sex for purposes other than what God intended, not because I'm a bad human being, but because I'm a sick human being in those areas. And I needed that sex to build the personal relationships and etc. And when I saw that, a lot of guilt began to disappear. I'll tell you another thing that started happening to me in column three. I began to get a handle on this sex thing. You see, I always thought I was over sex, and that caused me to do those things. But in column three, I found out, hell, I'm not oversexed, I'm under secure. And I use sex to build my security and to build my self esteem. And when I saw what I was doing with sex, it began to look pretty stupid to do those things. And a lot of that desire to go do it at the wrong time in the wrong place with the wrong people began to disappear. And I started getting a handle on the sex thing right here in the third column. I think it's one of the greatest things that we can do for ourselves, especially we men. We tend to use sex to build self esteem. And sex doesn't have really anything to do with it. We tend to use it to build our self-esteem. And when I saw that's what I was doing with it, then a desire to go do it became less and less. Column four. What feelings did I create in others? Did I unjustifiably arouse jealousy, suspicion, or bitterness? What should I have done instead? In column four, not only are we looking to see those things that we did... But we also need to be looking at what should we have done instead. We're trying to shape a new sex life of the future where we can still engage in it and enjoy it, yet at the same time not hurt other people. Column 5. Which character defect is involved? Same old deal. If I wasn't so selfish, I wouldn't be doing some of those things in a sexual area that hurt other people. If I wasn't so dishonest, I wouldn't be sneaking around behind my wife's back lying to her all the time anyhow. If I wasn't so afraid of facing life without that sex to build my self-esteem and ego and etc., probably wouldn't be doing it in the first place. If I really considered my wife and my children and other human beings ahead of my own needs and wants, I wouldn't be doing those things that's going to take a chance on hurting other people. But I'll guarantee you, if I stay selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate, I'm going to keep right on doing the same old things. I'm going to keep right on hurting people in the sexual area. I'm going to have to be scared to death of what they're going to do if they catch me. The guilt and remorse eats me up. Sooner or later, it blocks me off from God, and I end up drunk over it. It's not a question of right and wrong. It's a question of what can we do and live with it with peace of mind and happiness and be able to stay sober in the future. At the very least, we're going to have to do something about some of these things, or sooner or later it eats us up. Now, once again, we're doing step four. This is the sex part. In the fifth column, we see all the information now we need for step five, six, and seven. Quite naturally, all the names in column one will come off of this sheet and be added to the sheet to be used later on for steps eight and nine. Again, I was amazed to see in many cases the same names appearing on all three sheets. Barbara was certainly on all three sheets. 
I even had the Internal Revenue Service on all three sheets. I resented them, and I feared them, and I gave them a pretty good screwing before I got through with them, too. <laughs> now let's see what we do with this information. He said, in this way, the way it was just outlined, in this way we tried to shape a sane and sound ideal for our future sex life. We subjected each relation to this test, well, was it selfish or not? And prayer is going to be used three different times in, this, in the next page or so. Here's the first one. We asked God to mold our ideals and to help us to live up to them. We remembered always that our sex powers were God-given and therefore good, neither to be used lightly or selfishly, nor to be despised or loathed. See, God never did give us anything that was bad. Whatever our ideal turns out to be, we must be willing to grow toward it. We must be willing to make amends where we've done harm, provided that we do not bring about still more harm in so doing. In other words, we treat sex as we would any other problem, more prayer. In meditation, we ask God what we should do about each specific matter. The right answer will come if we want it. And God alone can judge our sex situation. Counsel with others, other persons, is often desirable, but we let God be the final judge. We realize that some people are fanatical about sex as others are loose. We avoid hysterical thinking or advice. You know, this is an area that I don't think we need a whole lot of advice in anyhow. I think all of us, deep down inside, we know what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. You know, I've never been in a sexual situation yet that was wrong, that I didn't know it was wrong before I ever got into it. Didn't keep me getting into it. But I never got into one yet that was wrong, that I didn't know it was wrong before I ever got into it. And if you start running around asking people for sexual advice, if you ask six different people, you're going to get six different answers. And then you'll have to decide which one of those to follow. And besides that, I really can't think of a worse place in the world to get sexual advice than in the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous. <laughs> I think that's a hell of a place to look for it. I think all we got to do is listen to that little voice inside. I think it pretty well knows, and I think it'll pretty well tell us what we should and what we shouldn't do. And if we follow it, we're probably not going to hurt other people. Now, suppose we fall short of the chosen ideal and stumble. Does this mean we're going to get drunk? Well, some people tell us so. But this is only a half-truth. It depends on us and our motives. Now, if we're sorry for what we've done and have an honest desire to let God take us to better things, we believe we'll be forgiven and have learned our lesson. Now, if we're not sorry and our conduct continues to harm others, we're quite sure to drink. Now, we're not theorizing. These are facts of our experience. You know, I had a young fellow come to me not long ago. <clears throat> He's still in his 20s. And he said, Charlie, my sponsor told me I couldn't have any sex the first year of sobriety. Is that right? And I said, no, that's not necessarily right. I said, you can have all the sex you want the first year. The second year, you can have it with other people. <laughs> uh, you know, sometimes it's hard enough to quit drinking without doing some other things, too. Yeah. Now, to sum up about sex, we earnestly pray for the right idea, more prayer. We earnestly pray for the right ideal, for guidance in each questionable situation, for sanity and for the strength to do the right thing. Now, if sex is very troublesome, we throw ourselves at the harder end of helping others. We think of their needs and work for them. This takes us out of ourselves. It quiets the horny condition. Oh, it quiets the imperious urge. When to yield would mean heartache. Oh, Bill used some fancy words, didn't he? Uh. <laughs> okay. Now, we're going to make one other suggestion before we leave the inventory. Uh, the book says we have, uh, we have the, the list for our amends. We made it and we took step four. And we've looked at people we've heard on the resentment sheet. We looked at them on the fear sheet. We looked at them on the sex sheet. But there's other people we've heard in other ways, too, that perhaps haven't popped up on any of these sheets. Maybe somebody we stole money from them. Or maybe we, somebody we hurt physically. Many ways we hurt people. And any of those names that haven't come up on at least one of these three sheets... We suggest we take this fourth sheet, a review of harms other than sexual, 
and do exactly the same thing with it that we have done with the other sheets. Column one, who did I hurt? Column two, what did I do? Column three, what part of self is affected? Column four, what feelings did I create in others? What should I have done instead? Column five, which character defect is involved? And if we'll do that, then we've got everything we need here for four, five, six, and seven, eight, and nine. And when we've done this sheet, when we have completed our inventory, we've got everything we need now for four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine. And now then we're ready to get on with our business. Very, very simple procedure. Now let me ask you something. Did we see anything here to be afraid of? Did we see anything that was so complicated we couldn't do it? Did we make a list of dirty, filthy, nasty items? Did we get any positive results from this? Yes. Is there any reason why we shouldn't go ahead and do step four? We don't need to procrastinate any longer, do we? It is simple enough that we can get with it, get on with the program. A little bit of study and a little bit of help with your sponsor and a couple of evenings, you can have it done just that quick. Now, the book says if we've been thorough about our personal inventory, we have written down a lot. We have listed and analyzed our resentments. Now, some people look at the word analyzed as a bad word. All this is is another word that means truth. We have taken a truthful, a moral, truthful, honest, analytical inventory. To analyze something simply means to get down to the truth of it. Now, he didn't say it, but we've listed and analyzed our fears. We've listed and analyzed our sexual harms. We've listed and analyzed harms other than sexual. We've begun to comprehend their futility and their fatality. We have commenced to see their terrible destructiveness. Now, here's some results. We have begun to learn tolerance, patience, and goodwill toward all men, even our enemies, for we look on them as sick people. My God, what a change in personality already. This is a real change taking place here in step four. We don't have to wait till step 12 to get something. We have listed the people we've hurt by our conduct and are willing to straighten out the past if we can. In this book, you read again and again that faith did for us what we could not do for ourselves. We hope you are convinced now that God can remove whatever self-will has blocked you off from Him. If you've already made a decision... To step three. ...and an inventory of your grosser handicaps, you have made a good beginning. That being so, you have swallowed and digested some big chunks of truth about yourself. So now, what are, what are some of the grosser handicaps in which we've looked at? Resentment, fear, guilt, and remorse. What are some of the basic character defects that we've looked at in the, in the basic cause? Selfish, dishonest, self-seeking, frightened, and inconsiderate. We have really looked at those things very carefully, haven't we? Now, the book recognizes it will never be perfect. It said these are our grosser handicaps. I think one of the great mistakes being made in AA today is everybody's sitting around and waiting until they get well so they can do step four perfect. (laughs) You can't do that. Let's get rid of these grosser things. We've got another step later on that we're going to use this process for the rest of our life. We'll be inventorying forever, and it'll get better and better. But these are the major things that kill us. We got them behind us. Now we can get on with our business.